Thank you, Bob. Well, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? OK, good. Uh, I guess first I will warm up the crowd. So we'll ask a few sample questions here. Uh, just give me a show of hands on these questions. How many of you think we're running out of energy? Not too many, no crisis, OK. Uh, how many would cut house size or vehicle use to help conserve energy? Wow, a lot more. Huh? You mean from what, what we now have ourselves or from what other people have? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many think pollution is beyond reasonable limits? Ooh, that's interesting. And finally, how many see our environmental see an environmental apocalypse in their lifetime? How many think that will happen? No, oh, that's. No, I'll I'll jot all this down and correspond with you. <laughs> Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a presentation here on fracking, primarily from, let's say, an engineering point of view to start with, to give you the basics of it. And then for the economics, we'll go through some numbers and facts, primarily relating to New Mexico, uh, since that's our focus here. And then uh, what I will do is a uh, call for some students to volunteer for a little bit of role playing here so you students can be thinking who it'll be. Uh, I'd like one to be the governor, uh, one to be the secretary of the environment, one to be secretary of energy, and one to be secretary of what they call it now, human resources, I guess. So, and then we'll have a little debate to advise the governor on policy with respect to energy. Okay, so we're ready to roll here. Uh, now, I say this is the monster in our backyard uh, at the outset because, as you're probably aware, but I will underline, um, New Mexico is blessed with a tremendous amount of energy of all kinds, including natural gas. Last the number I saw, I think it was number two in the country by state in terms of natural gas. So we're into this debate whether we like it or not. Okay, well let's talk about fracking, get right into the meat of the matter here. Uh, what is fracking anyway? Fracking, or we'll call it, you could call it cracking of rocks. Fracking is the fracturing of rock to release natural gas which is primarily methane, but there are other gases in there as well, or oil, or both. A huge amount of water, uh, let's talk in terms of roughly a million gallons per well, uh, is used with some chemicals and a lot of sand mixed in with the water at high pressure to break up the rock. This is forced down with powerful pumps. And in a moment, I will show you slides so you can visualize better what I'm talking about. But let's just get the general idea here. This is usually done at about a mile or more underground. And it often happens below existing oil formations. So like in southeastern New Mexico, you're at the Permian Basin formation. Below that is another whole new formation. And so that's what you're after with fracking. It is a major activity in New Mexico because we have uh, so much energy resources. OK, now let's see how uh, fracking is done. Uh, here's a typical setup. Uh, as you probably know, this is called the rig in the jargon of the trade. We talk about how many rigs are in the field or how many rigs are being used for drilling. 
Um, as I recall, we'll find out that New Mexico has over, I think, over 50,000 rigs. It sticks in my mind. No, the, the, there's a whole lot up in the southwest near Farmington, too. That's the San Juan Basin. Now, here is all the different supplies. We have well pipe here, for example. Uh, this is probably chemicals. And uh, here's where the engineers have their setups. So it's, it's, it's not too mysterious what's there. This is the key thing here uh, in our uh, setup. Now, first we start at the, this is called in the trade, whoops. This is the wellhead. And these guys here are known in the business as roughnecks. <laughs> and they're tough. Uh, um, so uh, they uh, move all the equipment around, bolt on the pipes, connect the hoses. Uh, now, this is helpful, more helpful than you might think to observe this picture because we have to think about the question of controlling pollution. Pollution can include methane, which is coming up the pipe and escaping into the air. Methane is a greenhouse gas. In fact, it's much more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of number of parts per million of methane to give you a, a certain amount of greenhouse effect compared to carbon dioxide. So who's going to notice it? these guys. Uh, now, it's not that they don't have tools. There, are in, there is instrumentation developed, and more is being developed every day now. It's kind of a big new industry. Instrumentation for monitoring fracking. Uh, the company that bought my company makes some of it. So uh, there is instrumentation, but like most instrumentation, it tends to be very delicate, all kinds of little knobs and buttons and screens and things. It's probably over in one of those trailers you saw in the prior slide. But these guys have to be sensitive to what's going on. Uh, and the, the instrumentation ideally would monitor for gas leaks at the wellhead, as well as the water that's after you've pumped it down into the ground, it's coming back up again. Okay. Now, here we get, an, get a look at what's really happening. I'll try and point this out to you without hopefully getting uh, too technical. Uh, now, let's see here. Here it is. This is a typical setup in that a lot of the fracking wells are located where there are the conventional oil wells. In other words, they have their rigs pumping oil now. And this could be right here. And they might be 500 to 1,000 feet deep. And then along we, along we come and bring in that bigger rig that I just showed you. And it's drilling all the way down here to, let's say, 5,000 feet. So we're going through this formation into another formation. Now, this formation up here often was loose gravel, other things so that, or even a whole cavity, so that the oil could flow. The reason why what we're looking for now was not exploited in the past, other than the depth, was that it's not in loose gravel or open caverns or something like that. It's in a rock called shale. Uh, you've probably seen sh a shale for roofs, for example. It tends to be a blackish, grayish color. I'll show you a picture. So you've got to get the oil or gas, or both, out of that shale. So what you do is you drill down, 
And now here's an interesting part. You turn a corner and then start drilling this way, drilling horizontally. From a technological point of view, this is where it took a couple of breakthroughs. One is developing the machinery that could turn a corner and drill this way. And then another thing was to develop the instrumentation that you drop, as we say, downhole. You drop it downhole to give you an idea when you want to turn the corner when you're going to find yourself right in a bunch of, of uh, gas and oil. Uh, because this is very expensive. Uh, we, we might have gotten through a million bucks just to get here. So we want to hit the target the first time. And we don't want to break any equipment and so on and so forth. There's a whole, it's much more complicated than the good old days when we just drilled that. So I have here uh, a detailed view of the pipe casing going along. And what we do is we have holes in the pipe casing right here. And when we pump the water in at very, very high pressure, it goes up like this into the shale and breaks the shale apart. Then we disconnect the water First, we pump it out, we disconnect the system, and we go to getting the gas, let's just concentrate gas, I'll forget about the oil. And, and it comes down here and goes back up like this. Nothing works exactly as cleanly as that. Some of the water is still down there, you got a, a gas water mix, and you know, as a practical matter, it's more complicated than I've explained but I hope this gives you a general idea. Uh, now, from the point of view of... Sir? Yes. In New Mexico, we don't have that much water. Where are they getting the water? Uh, they get it up from the groundwater, usually, or maybe uh, from surface water if they're near a mountain range. But you can recover the water. Well, same way we do here in Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, we are now getting water out of the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. You can't drink that water. You have to clean it up. But you can't clean a public system out of benzene, toluene, 57 oh, yeah, oh, chemicals, and radioactivity, not possible. Yes, it is. No, it isn't, sir. Never mm -hmm. seen it. Oh. Tell me, cite one example of a public system that could clean out those toxins. Well, one, one is Singapore. When you go to Singapore, they give you a welcome bottle of water, which comes well, from... Well, they can in New York. They're spending nine millions of gallons of water per well, and in Texas, three million per well. We got two hundred thousand wells in one county. There's no way to clean it up, sir. Oh, okay. Well, it's your I mean, opinion. I just, no, it isn't your opinion. It's a fact. Science well, is fact. Okay. Um, now, uh, what we have here is one of the things that we address ourselves to in trying to make this as safe as possible. And that is, this is the casing which goes here. And this is usually a combination of steel and concrete. When they had that platform that blew up in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean when was that, about a year ago, part of the problem was that the, that the casing mechanism uh, broke apart. So this casing is very critical part of it all. Now, um, yes. Yes, sir. After the shale extraction, does the gas come out on its own or does it have to be pumped out? Oh, no. It, you, it generally comes out on its own because it's under pressure in the shale. But if need be, it can be pumped out. But, but the... But the Yes, that's right. You, you, could, you could think of the gas in the shale as if it were air in a balloon, and the balloon's been squashed. And then when you put these holes in, it's like puncturing the balloon, and the air rushes out. So it's a, it's a change in pressure that's been created. Um, 
Now this is what shale looks like. And uh, I don't have much to say about it other than it looks pretty much like ordinary rock. This shale is very blackish. Uh, and uh, that may be oil in it. Uh, but I don't know whether with this particular sample of shale exactly what its composition is. Then this is what things look like back up at the wellhead. Uh, we can use uh, conveyances such as these to get the water in and to get the gas out. And there's a whole lot of this stuff up here. And so that will give you some idea of what it looks like up there. Now, let's see. Uh, here is, uh, uh, this is right from the Scientific American. I stole this picture here. Uh, and here we have the wastewater pond where the water that came up here goes up here and into this pond. And then here are the, th and there's a farm over there to give you an idea of scale. And uh, here I'll give you some of the things that can go wrong. I was telling you about a crack in the concrete casing, chemicals leaking into the groundwater. Uh, let's see what else have we got here. Well, I don't see it right here, but another one would be methane going out into the air. Uh, now, um, let's get a look now at something on, in terms of energy demands. Uh, this is data I have for 2008 and 2035 on a worldwide basis. Um, right, uh, right now, we're pretty close to 2008. Coal, oil, and biomass uh, is, uh, I'm just looking for the units. Oh, here we are. Millions of tons of oil equivalent is, this would be 8,599,000 tons of oil equivalent of energy consumption. And it's projected in 2035 to be 10,000, I mean 10 billion for an 18% increase. We won't worry about that number so much as to look at the other things in comparison. That will give us a clearer picture of what's going on. Here's natural gas. Right now it's what? Uh, a little less, somewhere between a third and a quarter by energy units of what is consumed for coal, oil, and biomass and will be inching up closer to one half of those. Or in other words, increasing by 63% is the projection. This is after you got the gas where it needs to be not in the production of it, right? This is the uh, so-called clean fuel that is clean at that point, but it's not reflective of production. Is that correct? That's right. This is the gas going into power plants and trucks right. and everything else. Then nuclear, hydro, wind, and solar, uh, they're kind of grouped together because they, none of them are creating a, uh, a, a footprint, a carbon footprint. Uh, they are going from, let's say, a billion to two and a quarter, two and a half billion, or up 120 percent. Obviously, that's mainly wind and solar. Some hydro is being dis disconnected, torn down, and nuclear doesn't seem to be going anywhere. So that's wind and solar for the most part, when the increase. Now, uh, if we look at, I should have these numbers broken out separately, but the in increase, here's the total here. The total energy consumption goes from 12 billion to 16 billion up 37% total. So let's call that a little over 4 billion. Here's the interesting part. Uh, the renewables like wind and solar 
are very exciting. Uh, the renewables like wind and solar are very exciting. I don't see how anybody can argue against them. The only problem is, based on projections of the increase installed capacity of those energy sources, we're not even going to catch up with the increase of energy consumption of the world. It, it's like uh, being on some sort of a treadmill and going backwards. And let's look at this from the point of view of greenhouse gases. These are in relative units, and uh, they depend a lot on the proportion between natural gas, renewables, and coal and oil. But as best as I can estimate, uh, they would go from, say, uh, 10 million units to 12 million units. They go up 25%, the greenhouse gases. So they're, they're not going up as fast as the energy consumption, but they're not insignificant. And bear this in mind, I'll be with you a second, bear this in mind uh, in terms of the latest climate change forecasts, which say that we're at the tipping point, and it's really pretty hard to go backwards. And so it's really going to be tough to... Uh, solve this problem from a, just from the point of view of energy mix. And that's why I mentioned in the questions before this, well, would you live in a smaller house and not drive your car so much? That may be the ultimate answer. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there's, there's a number of proposals along that line. Would, would, it, would, would you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the lady here would like to know, would it be possible to have solar collectors in outer space and to beam the generated energy uh, down, down to Earth, have, solar, have energy collectors down here? A company I worked for years ago, Arthur D. Little, a big consulting firm, we did a project for NASA just that, with solar collectors and infrared beaming of the energy. And we calculate on a theoretical basis it should work. Are people afraid that it might be used as a weapon? Is that why they're reticent? Or? I, don't, I don't know. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't have the numbers on that, although I'm well aware of the argument. Oh, 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 the gentleman wants to know when you're, let me see if this sounds right, installing new solar and wind capacity, how about the energy, how about the carbon footprint you're creating due to manufacturing and installation equipment compared to, compared that to the natural gas? And, I'm, and the issue has been brought up a good deal in the, in the literature. I don't remember the numbers except to say that the, uh, the, the, the carbon footprint for natural gas is high because you're doing a lot of fabrication of steel and moving a lot of heavy equipment from place to place. But I don't have the numbers at my fingertips. Uh, yeah. Could you define what you mean by greenhouse gases? Are those gases that are emitted to the atmosphere or are they recycled back into the system? Uh, the gentleman wants to know what are greenhouse gases. Uh, greenhouse gases are gases which, when they're in the, let's say, the atmosphere and above actually what we call the atmosphere, atmosphere as they move up to the troposphere and so on. Uh, which have the property of acting like glass. Uh, they bottle up some of the sun's uh, usually infrared energy so that that causes a warming as if it were the greenhouse. And uh, 
The one we hear about the most is carbon dioxide, and that's a serious greenhouse gas, but there are others, and the one that is less talked about but has a very pronounced effect is methane, which is natural gas, but it also bleeds off in things like uh, swamps. So when you have the uh, ice melting in the Arctic, it releases methane, so it adds to the problem. Yes, ma'am. I, I just have a problem that you're putting, you're um, putting nuclear with hydro, wind, and solar in terms of the potential for accidents and what the, the, uh, the implications would be in terms of the waste that is produced with nuclear. Um, it just seems to me that it's, it ought to be in a, in a class by itself. Oh. And you said it's going nowhere, but yet it seems, you know, that it's still proposed a lot. I mean, yeah. I don't agree, but it's... Yeah. That's the way it is. So um, I, I don't understand, again, I mean, you said well, the that reason, maybe it's not a part of Well, it. the reason that it was put in this line was that it does not by itself generate greenhouse gases. Okay, but it generates other types of pollution yeah. that, or potentially, yeah. that hydro, wind, and solar don't. Yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's not what I'm addressing myself to. I'll just leave you with a thought. How many people do you know who have died in coal mine accidents? Well, of course. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm not talking, again, I'm only referring to nuclear versus the other three yeah. that have in that category. And I agree with you. I am not saying that coal is particularly safe for our industry. And if you look at the mountaintop removal and that type of thing, too, it can have devastating. Now the, um, now the uh, um, a number of people say wind should be taken off of there because it kills birds. So now we're down to solar. I don't know. We'll, we'll whittle down the list. Let's go move on. I mean, I'm just having a little problem with the, the science here because in the natural gas line of things, you're talking about post-production. And when we're talking about production in terms of not just the production of the natural gas but the collection plant, you're talking at high levels of VOCs resulting in, you're talking far more toxicity formaldehyde, uh, you're talking about um, bioavailable uh, benzene, toluene, and they add now pesticides to the mix. So you are now talking about a major level of VOCs not representative. And when he goes back and tells you about the pipes that crack, we, we find pipes crack usually within the first month of putting them in. So you've got leakage into underground and you've got uh, expiration into the air. Not reflected in this figure, which is tremendously high. Also, this natural gas, a high percentage of it is sold for out of the country use. So we have been absolutely sold on we must eat all of this and sacrifice ourselves. And it goes to, we, there is a new contract just built to Qatar, a Middle Eastern state, a country. Uh, okay, well, that's for another time. That's not what I'm talking it about. It's not represented. Uh, it's, it's a lie right there. Um, now this here is the cost of electricity generation at current prices for these energy sources. Um, this is what is the bottom line for many people. So uh, this is uh, some information. This is a chart that I found that kind of ties it all up. Uh, Natural gas is the lowest of, say, four cents per kilowatt hour. And we go up to new coal. This is uh, coal that's been recently mined, goes into the plant. That's a little higher than wind, natural gas, backup. Those, they're up around eight cents. I think that's a little bit on the low side, but I'll go with their figures. If you're to do a nuclear plant today, it would be, a, let's say, heading towards 11 cents a kilowatt hour. And then we get to solar with natural gas backup. That's up about the same level. Actually, I think solar is being announced now about 10 to 9 cents. But the proportions are about right. So uh, this gives you some idea uh, where the attraction is why the excitement for uh, natural gas is the low cost. Yes, sir? You're talking 
Oh, well, uh, well, I don't have any way of calculating that, right? Uh, when it moves into your neighborhood. Yes, yes ma'am. When they frack, are they fracking for natural gas? Well, they can frack for oil or natural gas or both. Okay. This, this guy was on TV. I'm not going to be saying his name right. I, I, I thought they said T-bone, but I know it's not T-bone. 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 Billionaire, yeah. And he was saying that we should take all of our military vehicles and put refill them for natural gas. And he said, "We keep on point, right?" Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. One second. I can say it in one sentence. He said we should refuel all our military vehicles and put natural gas in them and stop getting oil and natural gas from Iraq and Iran and other places. So, what do y'all think? We never had a shortage of natural gas. 2005, Bush and Shady, take all regulations off of oil and gas, pesticide, and mining. And then they, they develop stuff. I'm going to have to ask you this. Okay, but I will say this. I no, no, really. You won't. All right, fine. No, you won't. No, I won't. You're right. Please, please. 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 All right, and also, when are we having drilling move in? That's what I want to know. Please, let's be courteous. Yes, let's. Okay, I pulled together some numbers for you here. Uh, it's not exhaustive, and you might disagree with my selection, but it's what I could find to help think about it in terms of context. Uh, and, and you have to see these numbers from the point of view of other people, why they would be enthusiastic about natural gas, whether or not it's a good idea. And as you can see from the election campaign, jobs is a biggie. And so we find out that shale gas created 600,000 jobs in 2010. Now, they may not be permanent jobs. These may be drilling, laying pipe, and so on, but they're jobs. And so that's something that is in natural gases corner. Um, with the new gas reserves available due to fracking, uh, recent figures are that the U.S. reserves have gone from dozens of years to over 100 years. But that doesn't solve all our problems. Our grandchildren will live beyond that. So that doesn't solve everything. But anyway, this number is bandied about, so there you have it. Oil and gas contributes about $2 billion a year to New Mexico state and local government through taxes. Um, as I recall, yes, here it is. It accounts, for example, 20 to 25 percent of the state's general fund. So from the point of view of uh, the practicalities of uh, managing the state and all its obligations, suddenly this takes on a new point of view. Uh, in New Mexico, over half of the, this is the severance tax <coughs> primarily, is from natural gas as opposed to oil. Um, and another random number here, New Mexico has 52,000 oil and gas wells, and the majority use fracking. We're already there in fracking. There is natural gas almost everywhere in New Mexico with perhaps the nation's largest fields in the San Juan Basin near Farmington and good fields in the Permian Basin near Hobbs. Western New Mexico has great extra solar potential. Eastern, uh, excellent wind potential. There are always already are wind farms. And the Rio Grande Valley is rich in geothermal energy, which hasn't even been touched yet. Um, here are some figures. Also, electric energy, over 60% uh, comes from coal, 20% from nuclear. Uh, the nuclear plant is actually in Arizona, about 8% natural gas and 7% renewables. Uh, the target for 2020 is 20% renewables for PNM and 10% for cooperatives. 
uh, the New Mexico is fourth in the U.S. in installed solar uh, capacity. Um, PV is photovoltaic. 67% uh, of the homes in New Mexico use natural gas for heating. And vehicle gasoline consumption per capita in New Mexico is about twice the U.S. average because of the longer distances uh, driven. The, yes, sir. The third bullet, is, is that per capita? Fourth in the U.S. installed solar PV capacity? I, no, I, no, I think it's total. total. There's some very big ones up, like near Cimarron. Uh, OK, let's look at the emissions. And this is hard to dig out, but I'll give, do, give it my best shot. Um, about twice the U.S. per capita average of greenhouse emissions due to intensive gas, oil, and coal operations in New Mexico. Over 90% of our greenhouse gas emissions occur at the coal-fired power plants. Uh, the San Juan and the Four Corners plants, they were practically next to each other, produce about 75% of the total. As you're probably all aware, it's almost every day there's an article about them in the newspaper. Santa Fe's air is rated about the cleanest of any U.S. city. And the coal soot from the Four Corners plant can be seen for miles. I took a photo of it from uh, Colorado. And, uh, well, up, up, way up in Colorado. Uh, so the question is, what should we do? Uh, you see, we've, yes, sir. Um, I don't know much about them. Uh, oh, the, the, he'd like to know, do I, do I think that micro, microbial fuel cells yes. will improve the situation? Would this be an important source of energy, are you asking? Yeah, the, the um, I don't know, frankly. I, that's, a, that's an area I'm not that familiar with. I, one thing I do know, I've been, men, I've been meaning to slip it into the talk here. There is an interesting experiment going on near Hobbs to take the frack water, the water after it comes out of the well, and they put it in great big basins and uh, plant it with algae to make biomass fuel. And we'll see where that goes. Biomass fuel has been used experimentally by Virgin Airlines, the Air Force, the United Airlines has experimented with it as jet fuel. So, where this will all go, I don't know, but that's one outlet for the, uh, for the uh, frack water. Any other questions? Oh, yes, ma'am. Just about the frack water, and I'll keep it brief. Um, I heard that there was 200 chemicals that they need, otherwise it won't work, and that the 200 chemicals causes capillary action, reaction, in, in order to pull it up mm -hmm. and get it out uh, yeah. both ways. Well, if they can't test ahead of time to find out the before and the after, the farmers with their wells, how do they know if, if, if they're getting contaminated? Because it's proprietary. Well, um, the figures I've heard are five or six chemicals, but whatever it is, yes, you, what you want to know, the lady would like to know, but how to measure or to detect well, the chemicals? They're not allowed because it's proprietary, so you mm. don't well, no, but you can test water for VOCs, for example. Oh, okay. Can you define it proprietary? What's that? Can you define it? Well, proprietary. Well, secret? Yes, they call it secret. That's a simple word. Why? Well, they, they, they call it secret because it's a trade secret. But it goes into community water, right? Yes. But it's secret uh, elements going into our Yes. But, but that's no reason you can't measure the water for chemicals. For what? For chemicals. You, you can measure the water for... 
What? You mean after the fact? Yeah, after the fact or. Mm-hmm. What? You mean after the fact? Yeah, after the fact or. Mm-hmm. But that might be too late. It, it might be, be, yes. And it is often. That, that to me is like, what should we do? That, um, that's a big concern, right? Yeah. Yes. The proprietary is a big uh, loaded word or a charge. Yes. A word that, uh, that fright, you know, can be somewhat frightening. Yes. Uh, but anyway, that's not what I'm addressing myself here to. So that would, we've well, got to. I think we need to. Yes. Oh, I agree. It would be a good thing to talk. Um. Okay, now, uh, let me see. How much of my time have I got? We have 20 minutes to an hour. 20 minutes to an hour left? We have, we have 40 minutes, but yes. Okay. Um, now, what I would like to do is to highlight a little bit about the trade-offs here, that there's no one single right answer. No matter what you do, somebody's going to be upset or something won't be right. Uh, I'd like to get a couple student volunteers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I want somebody, some student to volunteer to be governor. Who will be governor? Uh, Larry, before we do that, yeah. let me just say, uh, I handed out this evaluation form. I need a volunteer from some student to be governor. Oh, there's a volunteer. Could you come up here? Uh, what's your first name? Chance. Chance? Okay, Chance. So you'll be governor. Okay, now I need an energy secretary. Come on, I need an energy secretary. Some I need a volunteer. There he goes. Could you come up, please? We're going to have a cabinet meeting, so I need an energy secretary. And what's your first name? Uh, Sona. What? Sona. Sona? Um, and now I need an environmental secretary. Okay, young man. And what's your name? Hunter. Huh? Hunter. Hunter. So Hunter is the uh, environmental secretary. And finally, I need a human resources. It used to be called labor secretary. Would you like to be that? And what's your name? What? Jacob. Um, probably not. And we've got a problem here because you want to fund your programs with oil and gas taxes, right? For education and roads and so on, right? Um, but there are downsides to this. Um, will the environmental secretary, Hunter, will you speak up and advise the governor what he should think about before he goes wild on gas? What should he do? What should he think about? for protecting our environment in New Mexico. Speak out to them. Not, so you read the energy secretary recommends not to get drill for too much natural gas? Now, now, the governor has a problem. He has to keep his tax revenue up, which he gets from oil and gas. But what should he be thinking about, on the other hand, from environment? It's not... To release too much gas? So, what, what do you recommend how to deal with that? Safety for the drills. 
stop gas from, from being released? So you feel that he should continue to uh, encourage drilling for gas, but take more safety precautions. Is that, do I understand you right? Yes. Okay. Now uh, let's turn to Sono, the energy secretary. Uh, now we've got lots of sun, we've got uh, geothermal, wind, but we've got tons of natural gas also. We, all, we also, got, everybody knows, got coal. So what do you recommend to the governor on how to balance this out here? Uh, that we should probably not use too much of one thing, but just kind of balance out the amount we need like solar, wind, natural gas. Balance out, not just use too much of one. So we should uh, hedge our bets, you might say? Like use, not use like all the natural gas. We should also use a wind power system, natural and solar. Uh-huh. Okay. And now uh, we have Jacob. Uh, now, you, you, we, there's another issue here. We have to keep people working. And uh, all of these sources of energy, or all the applications of these kinds of energy, um, use people. They're not automatic. Uh, but a political problem is that the oil and gas industry uses a lot of people. I mean, we're talking big numbers. So if we go to the other energy sources, it's going to maybe give us an unemployment problem, but maybe not. I'm, I'm just throwing ideas around. I want you to think about it and then advise the governor here. Um, from the point of view of labor issues, uh, should we uh, forge ahead with gas and oil, or should we uh, really go in big time for wind and solar? Well, it'd be good to go into wind and solar because you know that you'd always have it. Is if you just go all into coal, eventually it's going to run out, and then all the jobs would be gone. But if you like go into it and gradually move into wind and solar, then you can always keep people employed. Uh, let's let's look at this from a di an additional uh, degree of sophistication here. Now, oil and gas have have a bad reputation because, as I pointed out earlier when I was talking about the roughnecks, you don't get a high level of labor in terms of their education. In fact, this is one of the reasons in New York State. They're arguing against fracking is because they'll bring in to the peoples, bring into the state people who are not desirable residents. Now, uh, solar and wind would appear to require higher level of education, engineers, technicians, electronic people, and so on, chemists, and so on. But do you think that New Mexico is generating enough technicians and engineers to uh, people this burgeoning uh, renewables energy industry? Whoop. <laughs> Do you want to? Yes? So, so if you're going to go into, let's say, the solar industry, uh, where will you go to get a suitable education? Will you learn some in this high school here? Probably. Community college, maybe. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, more yeah, better. More better. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now we'll come to the governor, uh, Chance. 
what are you going to do? Are you go, what, what, what energy policy are you going to pursue now that your secretaries here have weighed in on the issue? You're going to go for wind and solar. OK, good. <laughs> um, OK, we've hit 7 o'clock. Is that a good time? Uh, OK, good. Well, I think we wound up about right. Uh, I hope you people do become cabinet secretaries and governors. We need good people. <laughs> Thank you. Plus the fact that might be another excuse for improving the educational system here. Well, there's no doubt about the latter point. <laughs> that was the case. So, so thank you all very much for coming tonight. I think we had a provocative discussion. You can see that it's a sensitive issue for lots of people, just rightly so. Uh, and uh, that's part of the function of these cafes, is to have these kinds of discussions with kids and with adults and the community at large. So we're very glad you're here. The next cafe is November 7th. Um, I can't remember whether it's a Wednesday or Thursday, one or the other, and uh, it's going to be something that's titled.